We're honored to have with us this evening uh, Paul Huntsman, who is the owner and publisher of the Salt Lake Tribune, and as you know, uh, one of John Hunts and Karen Huntsman's sons. And uh, Paul is also joined here tonight uh, by Allison Huntsman Morgan. Uh, Allison, would you please stand up? Uh, Allison is a, an alumna of the Huntsman Scholar Program, and her husband Joe is here with us. Joe, stand up and say hi. And also, I think you all know David Huntsman, who's in the role in the program and is a sophomore this year. So we're glad to have those members of the Huntsman family represented here this night. Um, if we could get that music uh, knocked off, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, John and Karen would love to have been here this evening. And uh, unfortunately, John is not in the best of health. Uh, so we're delighted, Paul, that you agreed to pitch it. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I think it would be great if we could uh, get Paul to talk a little bit about his business, the, the Salt Lake Tribune, the newspaper business generally. But the purpose that we've really asked Paul to come here tonight uh, and to reflect about is, is his, his father's life as an entrepreneur, as a uh, global leader, uh, as an ethical leader and as somebody who has been such a great friend and benefactor of the Huntsman School. I took Paul over just a moment ago to show him the John M. Huntsman Library and you know that whole space over there is essentially the library and tonight we will be ceremonially cutting the ribbon on that space uh, and its intention is that for generations to come we'll be able to have John Huntsman's presence with us and also his values illuminating and guiding our students as they prepare themselves for a world of, uh, of, of challenge and a, a lifetime of service. Uh, it is tonight the, uh, the 10th anniversary uh, of the initial Huntsman gift and the naming of this college in honor of John M. Huntsman and Paul mentioned it's amazing that 10 years have gone by so quickly and I agree with him about that. But Paul, if we could get started, uh, maybe just reflecting a little bit on your father's life. Uh, he grew up not far from here initially in Blackfoot, Idaho and then moved in several different places in Utah and then down to California. Can you talk a little bit about that early life and the experiences that he had and the, um, the forces that shaped his uh, personality? Sure. Um, Absolutely, and Dean Anderson, thank you very much for having me here, and it's wonderful to be here with all of you. Again, I apologize for uh, my father not being here. Um, uh, there's no one really that can fill in for him, but again, I'm very honored to be able to be here and to re represent him this evening. Uh, as many of you probably know, my father, he was, he was born in Blackfoot, Idaho. Uh, his father was a rural school teacher. Uh, he was born in the late 1930s, and as you can imagine, the the economy at that time was uh, fairly depressed. Uh, he lived in very humble circumstances. Uh, his father taught out of a school of, uh, I believe there were four teachers at the time. Uh, so, you know, you're teaching the second grade one day and you're teaching uh, the tenth grade another day. And so you, between uh, uh, the kindergarten and through high school, you, you basically have four teachers uh, throughout the, uh, the rural environment. Uh, my, my father's never, forgotten his uh, rural roots in Idaho, in southern Idaho, and to some extent I think the, the culture and his love of this area I think is really extended down here as well, and I think it really has driven his desire to want to invest more uh, in the community here and the surrounding communities. But uh, uh, yeah, he, uh, he really grew up without a whole lot. I, I, again, we can talk about uh, there's monetary means, uh, but beyond that, really growing up understanding the world beyond rural Idaho, you know, I don't think he really understood what was the life, the opportunities that awaited him uh, while he was growing up. And it wasn't until he, he moved uh, in high school, his father at the age of 42 decided that he wanted to get his uh, PhD in teaching. He was, uh, he was, he was a music teacher. So he, he moved to Stanford and they moved into uh, student housing uh, in, the 19, in, the, uh, in the early 1950s. And so my father uh, had a number of jobs, J.C. Penney's being one uh, that he worked through throughout high school to continue to support his father while he got his PhD. And his father really didn't uh, uh, 
uh, finish his degree and until my father finished high school. So all during his time of growing up, he, uh, in many ways, he was supporting his father as well. And so um, uh, in terms of, you know, having a father that, uh, you know, provided counsel and uh, was there to kind of mentor him, uh, in many ways, he was, he was there supporting his father with the very meager means which they had. And uh, it was, it was a, it was a, I wouldn't call it a tough life, but uh, he, he, uh, he did work hard to make sure that his family uh, had the necessary means to get by in life. You know, uh, I should say my mother is here tonight as well, and uh, I'm glad, Mother, I'm really glad to have you here with us. Does this sound familiar at all, Mother? Uh, my, my father uh, also went and got a PhD, and I remember, I didn't uh, support the family the way your father did, uh, but I remember those days of, of, of uh, working very hard in California. He was at USC. Uh, and it, it really does stretch the family uh, to go through that experience. Uh, and then later, uh, I, I went through that experience with my own family. So I know how, how difficult that is, but especially it was difficult, I think, in the day and time that, that uh, your father was growing up in Palo Alto. Uh, and as I recall uh, from my reading of, of Barefoot to Billionaire, I mean, he had responsibilities for paying the electricity bill and some of the yes. other house u utilities and so on. That was his responsibility. And I think his brother Blaine also had some responsibilities in that regard while, while your grandfather was finishing up his degree at Stanford. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, in-home plumbing was uh, quite a luxury back in those days. Yes. Uh, they, they did have that. It was actually outside the home. But yeah, uh, he and his brother worked hard uh, to support their their father through uh, through graduate school. Yeah, I think as I remember, uh, Stanford in those days was called the farm, and it yeah. kind of was a farm. Yeah. And didn't didn't they live in Quonset huts or something like that? Uh, we drove by them years ago. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think they exist anymore because I think uh, the land value there is right. so expensive. But yeah, uh, there, there were still some remnants when we drove by uh, many, many, many years ago. And uh, it's just something you won't ever find in that part of it's Northern not California very anymore. Long. No. Silicon no. Valley doesn't yeah. have Kwanzaa yeah. any longer. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure if you were to invest in a, or to buy a Kwanzaa hunt, <laughs> yeah. it wouldn't be what, at least the price today, what uh, I'm sure they pay Exactly. Back, yeah, so. so, Paul, your father was a, a, a leader early on in life and developed some really significant leadership qualities and capabilities. And among other things, uh, I believe he was elected student body president of yes. Palo Alto High School, wasn't he? Yes, yes, and, he was. Uh, what, can you tell us a little bit about that experience? I, uh, there's there's a, a memory that I have of of his bringing some of the janitors up on stage in a in an assembly uh, to give them some special recognition. Yeah, I've often thought if um, if leadership is something that is taught or is inherent in all of us, and as many of you have, have interact or have, have heard my father speak or have, uh, have worked with him, uh, he's a very unique individual that's really born with a lot of innate leadership skills. And, uh, and something that I think he, he recognized, he not only recognized, but more importantly, he took the risks to put himself in a position to, uh, to be in leadership roles at a very young age. And uh, I think as you share the example of, uh, of other employees around the school, uh, he also learned at a very young age that, uh, that giving to others, philanthropy, if you say, even though he didn't have much to give away, he still always wanted to recognize those that he felt were perhaps maybe less fortunate than he was around him. So those are skills, I mean, as much as we like to uh, teach about leadership skills, and I think all of us, within all of us, there's, there's more leadership potential than we realize I think with him, uh, he really did have uh, unique skills and attributes that I think he was smart enough to recognize at a very young age. One of those, I think, is the ability to recognize other people who often don't get recognized. Yeah. To not overlook or take for granted the, the people who are around you who are supporting and helping you, but are often somewhat invisible. In my memory serves me correctly. His father wasn't able to do much for him when he went away for college. I want to talk about that in just a moment. But he did give him, uh, as a going away present, a tie. Yes. And the memory that I have is that that's the same kind of a gift that your father gave the janitors in this assembly. So yes. the, the finest gift that his father gave him was also the gift that he 
he bestowed upon the, the, the people who had been taking care of the school and who hadn't had a chance to be recognized that much. Yes, and he still gives ties today. I'm, I'm <laughs> glad he's continued that tradition, even though uh, ties, would, ties aren't qualify, necessarily... That. Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, now, just speaking of, uh, of, of his experience going off to college, there's a great story about him being at home one day and the, and the principal calling him up and saying, John, there's a gentleman here uh, from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's got another gentleman by the name of Mr. Zellerbach with him, and I, I wonder if you'd come down and spend a little time and meet him. Can you tell us, take it from there? Sure. So, um, so my father, he was working at J.C. Penney's. It was a, a teacher work day from school, and, and um, uh, he was invited to come down to school. There was both the principal the Dean of Admissions at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as uh, Mr. Zellerbach, who was a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. And the three of them, actually, the University of Pennsylvania had, had called uh, Mr. Zellerbach prior to going to Northern California and asking him if there were any students that, uh, that he thought were qualified that would be good applicants for the Wharton School. And so they looked around, and the principal thought, well, we actually have a student body president. He doesn't have a lot of means, and I'm not sure if he can afford it. But uh, he may be an interesting uh, candidate to talk to. And so he, uh, he, once he finished his job, he went back to the school and interviewed with these uh, three individuals. And uh, whether you call it luck or whether you call it, uh, what is it, uh, opportunity. Karma. Um, um, when uh, opportunity and preparation yeah. meet, uh, some people call it luck. Some people call it being in the right place when you prepared yourself for it. Uh, they offered him a full ride scholarship to the Wharton School, which at that point he never heard of uh, the Wharton School uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, and um, and he ended up taking that uh, taking that scholarship and uh, beginning his education at the University of Pennsylvania. Now you're a graduate of Wharton as well, aren't you? Yes, yes. Tell us about Wharton a little bit from your perspective, and then tell us about what impact you think it had on your father. Well, I think it had a uh, had a, a huge impact on my father. Again, growing up in rural Idaho, if you think about his, uh, you know, th again, this is back before the days of television, before the days of internet. So your view of the world uh, is very narrow, and uh, the interaction, the people you have, is uh, is very confined compared to he can grow up in the same neighborhood today and still have a much more global view on the world. Whereas back in the 1930s and 40s, outside of maybe getting a magazine that would come through the uh, town once a week or once a month, you'd, you'd have very little interaction view of the world around you. And um, uh, so that, it, it was a very transformational event for my father, going back there and, uh, and being able to, uh, to meet a lot of individuals that would later uh, be running a lot of uh, banks and businesses, which he would later on be needing to, uh, to borrow money from and to uh, and to doing transactions with, and in so much of the world of business today, uh, so much of uh, business is done people by people. Uh, we obviously need to learn the quantitative and qual uh, the quantitative skills of understanding, and this is why we're here to get our education. But when it really bo really really boils down to it, it is really a people upon people. It's really a, a, a people and people. Uh, relationship in which you can really ultimately be successful in business. That's, in my opinion, one of the greatest barometers. And so it was really, uh, I think the education was one aspect, but the, but the friends and the relationships that he developed there were the individuals that lent him his first loan to buy his first business and, uh, and to help him um, find his uh, uh, first several transactions. It was his friends at Wharton that he turned to to help, uh, to help build when he obviously didn't have any money and didn't have a whole lot of resources. And it was a network that he built there that really, uh, that really helped him uh, begin to develop and grow the business. When we think of capitalism, we often think of financial capital. But I'm hearing two things additional to that that you're saying. One is the, your own personal human capital that you build and develop through the great learnings that you get at a place like the Huntsman School or at the place yep. like the Wharton School. And the other is the network capital or uh, relationship capital that you build as well, and that these are all assets that are critical to developing a great career and being able to oh, yes. position yeah. 
make great yeah. contributions. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier, uh, I'm the uh, publisher and, and, um, and owner of the Salt Lake Tribune. But most of my time, I'm also the, the president of Huntsman Family Investments. It's basically a family office where we go up and we, uh, we buy business, very, very similar that you would find in a private equity business. Uh, as you probably have heard, most of the Huntsman's uh, business empires revolved around Huntsman Corporation, which is a, uh, which is a global chemical enterprise. Um, but we're beginning to slowly diversify outside of that chemical business into a multitude of other businesses. Uh, it's a very, very, very competitive world out there to buy business. And there's, you've really got to be able to differentiate yourself in terms, of, in terms of finding the right business and convincing a buyer that you're the right buyer, although you're not necessarily the highest bidder, and you may not be uh, the one with the biggest check at the door, you still need to convince others that, A, your reputation, your surety of closing, uh, your understanding of exactly um, you know, your reputation, your credibility, your integrity, all that matters today in terms of being able to transact and, fight and find the right deal. And I find that to be perhaps the most important characteristic that we have in terms of being able to find deals and transact deals more so than being able to write the largest check that you can in, in finding the right, uh, the right deal. So I really find that the human relationships are the most important aspects of being successful in business today. Your dad has often mentioned that his word is his bond. And uh, he, he certainly has demonstrated that in all the interactions that we've had with him. But there have been times when there's been great stress on the family and on him personally to be able to meet all of his obligations. There was a time at the turn of this century uh, when the company was in a very, very tight financial position and your father had made great promises to the University of Utah to fund the Cancer Institute. And he went to w Wall Street, to J.P. Yeah. Morgan, yeah. and took out a personal loan in order to make his payments, the contributions that he had made, the charitable contributions that he had made to the University of Utah, notwithstanding the fact that the company was, well, I don't know how close it was to bankruptcy, but it was not that far away. Yeah. Uh, is, do I have that right? No, that's absolutely true. Uh, when people say your word is your bond, uh, I've never seen anyone in the business community, and again, I'm appreciating this more and more as, as I get out, that he really does mean when he makes a commitment that he actually follows through. And that means if you have a charitable obligation that you're going to give to an entity such as, in this case, it was a Huntsman Cancer Institute in the form of hundreds of millions of dollars, that he went through and borrowed hundreds of millions of dollars only to give it away, only for the chairman of the private banking sector to say, well, John, you can't do that. He said, well, yes, I can do that, and that's what I'm going to do. And uh, he eventually convinced them. But uh, I don't know of any other human being, any other person, particularly in business, that would ever have that amount of integrity to go forward with a transaction like that. I, I, I've met the man who gave that loan to your dad. I, I, I met him in, in some uh, uh, professional activities that I have had. And it's astonishing to me that he got that. It's astonishing to me that your father got that loan. It's a testament of just how much credibility and integrity your father is, ref is viewed as yeah. having in, in the financial community. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It, it, it didn't start then. It's, it's been something that's been part of his human capital that he's built. That's over right. The years. That's right. And then again, just going back to my point earlier, yeah. the second generation has been a huge beneficiary of that. As we go out, as we do transactions, we're really, uh, as, as we explain who we are and who we represent, they want to do deals with us. Even though we're not the highest price, even though uh, we not be, may not be the biggest name out there, it's, it's knowing that they're going to be treated well, that uh, we're going to honor our contracts, that we're not going to get to the 11th hour and renegotiate and, re and back out of our contracts. It's the integrity and the reputation that you just can't buy. And that's really been the biggest uh, benefit as the second generation now is getting into business is 
the reputation that my father established in the business community. Now, Paul, you're touching on something that I think as a father is so important. Uh, there are many families that have made a lot of money, but as it passes down from one generation to the next generation to the next generation, you know very well that there's often very great difficulties sure. in, in managing and taking on that huge responsibility. How did your father instill in you the values that uh, that he represents? How, how did, and your mother, let me yeah. ask about your yeah. mother as well. Uh, and how are you trying to do that in propagating those same values in with your children and your nieces and nephews? Well, look, that, that's a uh, that's something we can spend hours and hours talking about. Um, I would just say, look, the bottom line with all the wealth that my parents accumulated over their lifetime, they gave the majority of it away. Thank goodness. So, you know, You're my generation and the third generation doesn't sit have to fight over who gets what. Um, and 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 so again, as I get older and as I look at. I interact with a lot of other large families, some of the largest families and the most wealthy families throughout the world. And most of them, uh, they're not talking to their, their siblings, their first cousins, their second cousins. They've been fighting. They've been suing each other for years. And uh, it's, it's really sad. Uh, the most successful and wealthy families, you look at almost all of them, and they're all suing each other by the time you get down to the second or third generation. But. Um, um, it, it's, uh, you know, all of us need to find in ourselves really, uh, you know, what our capabilities are. And there's actually one, um, forgive me for having to reference this, but um, there's, a, uh, there's a book that, and, a, um, and an author that my father often likes to quote. It's, uh, the, the writer's called O. Henry, and the book's called The Last Leap. But it basically uh, talks about that in all of us, there is a unborn masterpiece. And what, what, uh, what I mean by that is we all have this, uh, this potential within us of greatness that so often we never tap into. It's because we're either afraid of taking a risk, we lack courage, we lack uh, hard work, we sometimes like to fall back on excuses, and I think all of us naturally uh, fall back on our weaknesses, but very few of us actually want to step up, put ourselves in a situation where it's very uncomfortable in many ways, but we'll still push through as hard as we can to find out really what our potential is in life. So regardless of what you've been given in life and what your resources are, I think all of us to some extent want to find out really what, our, what we're capable of doing and what our true potential is in life. And I think that's what O. Henry uh, in this, uh, is written, I think, in the uh, 1800s was, uh, was, trying to, was trying to convey to all of us of, of, our, of our potential in life. And he has told me that often in life. And I've probably just out of guilt never wanted to disappoint him or also didn't want to disappoint myself. So you, know, you begin to put yourself in situations that are very uncomfortable. And you take a lot of risks. There's times where you fail. But you just got to keep fighting and eventually you find out uh, what, you're, what you're made out of in life. Uh, say a word or two about your mother as well. So, um, so my, uh, my father is the uh, risk taker and my mother's more of the, of the practical aspect of life. So she would go back and uh, my father would always say take the leap and my mother would make sure that we would uh, that we would fill in the blanks and that we would that we would think through it and that we would have a very logical uh, approach and a very practical approach to uh, to getting through in life and so they balance each other in many ways they had uh, they have very different characteristics and personalities but together uh, they made a wonderful team and have passed down wonderful qualities to uh, to all of us I want to open it up so our Huntsman scholars and others in the audience can ha ask have a chance to ask a question too but uh, I was with your dad the other day, and I noticed a baseball hat behind his uh, desk and said, the Great Great Guys Club. Can you talk a little bit about the Great Great Guys Club? David, why don't you come on up here? <laughs> <laughs> so the Great Great Guys Club is uh, great, great, great three. So it's basically the third generation. If it was the Great Guys Club, then that would be myself. But I'm not a member of that club. And since it's the Great Great Guys Club, yeah, actually, 
Uh, Joe, why don't you come on up as well? Because the, the, the Joe's part of that as well. So they are actually part of the Great Great Guys Club, and it's a club that my father formed for the third generation to carry on a lot of his attributes uh, and teachings in life. In case if we as fathers did not pass it down to the grandsons, he wanted to make sure that they got a swift kick in the pants and perhaps got <laughs> some of those advice. So, so I don't know if David wants to. It's not, I've never been to a meeting. I don't know any of the secret uh, handshakes or passwords or anything like that. But uh, What can you David, tell us? Yeah, there's a lot of secret handshakes, a lot of secret passwords. Um, no, I'm just kidding. So it's, it's a club that my grandpa started with all the grandsons and all the men from there into the family. Um, called the Great Great Guys Club, and what we do in that club, we, we have meetings twice a year. Uh, we establish rules and standards that we must live by in order to, to remain in the club, and they're all rules um, that we came up with internally, things that we, we must do, standards we must live by, um, kind of codes of conduct in order to, to be the best citizens and people we can possibly be. Um, for a long time, it was it was just a fun group and it would be fun to meet with each other, but most recently we took on the challenge and the opportunity to start raising money. We wanted to give back to the community, um, start doing something bigger than just the Great Great Guys Club. So we came up with a goal to, to raise money internally within the Great Great Guys Club, although we don't have a lot, many of us are college students or younger, um, to just do the best we can to put money together to donate back to the Huntsman Cancer Institute. So. Currently, that's what we're doing. Obviously, it's not a ton of money because uh, I don't have a lot of money. I'm a college student. Uh, but we do the best we can, and that's kind of what we're doing recently. But it's a really cool uh, club headed by my grandpa. A lot of things we're learning from him all the time. So it's really yeah, cool. Great. Joe, tell us just one or two words about what it's like to marry into the Huntsman family. <laughs> um, it, I'm lucky. Uh, you know, the great, great guy. Great, great guys club. Um, no matter what, so a lot of the third generation are older, some of them are younger. No matter where you're living in the world or around the country at the time, when you have one of these meetings, you attend. <laughs> there are many in-laws like myself who have lived elsewhere, and you always call in. And the most amazing thing is John's memory and his ability to connect with you and his ability to remember you and care about you. I believe if he were here, he would recognize a lot of your faces and he'd know a lot of your names and he would remember individual stories about you. Um, for those like me who lived away from him for years, you call into this meeting on a conference call and he'd say, hey, how's this going with work? And it would be something you told him six months ago that he remembered. And uh, that's what it's like, whether you're related to him or not. He knows about you, he cares about you, and he wants to instill in you things that he felt made him successful. Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right, well, let's open it up for some questions. Who'd like to ask Paul a question? Um, we have a mic, so if you'll just wait for just a second. Do you want to stand up or? Please do. Stand up and tell, say your name and what year you are. So I'm, my name is Levi Larson, I'm a junior. Um, this is my first year in the program. I, I've been mulling this over my head for a while, but so, John M. Huntsman has done amazing things for all of us, obviously. He's enabled us to have amazing opportunities. If he were here, um, what would he say is something that we could do to give back to him? Or what was something that he would say that we could do to give back because of this? Hmm. Good question. Um, I would probably say, um, look, I, I think this program is still relatively young, and uh, we're I think building a, a wonderful network of, uh, of graduates here. And, um, you know, there's always a philanthropy. And I think f for my father, that's always going to be his legacy. I mean, it's 50, 100 years from now, if people Google him or if his name's still around then, three or four generations, it'll be because of his philanthropy. But I think really uh, with, this, with this program here and the graduates, I think he's, he's uh, I think he would really like to see uh, to see all of you again. Going back to uh, the author that I mentioned, and being able to see the graduates go out there and find their potential and have an impact, not only from a, a commerce standpoint, on a business standpoint, but I guess also on a philanthropic standpoint, be leaders of the community. Uh, I think that's what he would really like to see. 
I serve on the board of, uh, of one of the Wharton undergraduate programs. It's called the uh, Huntsman Program at the University of Pennsylvania. And these are some of the top applicants all over the world that come in from the top prep schools into this highly competitive program. I mean, these, these applicants are, uh, are incredible. But the disappointing thing that I find from these graduates is they all kind of follow the herd mentality. They all go to New York, take the jobs in, in uh, Wall Street, and they kind of get stuck uh, because they're not willing to take a risk in life. They, uh, everything's perfectly calculated, and the whole point of this program was to develop the next global leaders. And we're now, I think, on our 20th year of graduates, and I look around at the graduates that have been out for 20 years, and I don't see any leaders. I see a lot of very smart, capable individuals who are very comfortable in a large financial institution. And it's very disappointing to see that they're not out there uh, making a greater impact in the community around them. They're, uh, they're settling into their jobs, and again, they're making a nice living, but for the talents and capabilities that they have, they're, they're not out there getting outside of their comfort zone and taking a risk and making an impact on the community, whether that's in public service, whether that's uh, in philanthropy or whatnot. They're, uh, they're just settling with, um, with their jobs. It was uh, President Theodore Roosevelt yeah. who said, dare mighty things, and that's, as you know, the motto of the Huntsman School, dare mighty yeah. things. So, Next question. My name's Hayden Hubbard. I'm just a freshman here, but um, I, I love to, I've been reading the Barefoot to Billionaire book, and I love to hear about his integrity, but I'd also love to know um, some of the experiences you've had, maybe where your integrity was tested and how you reacted um, as his son. Oh, when my, when my integrity was, uh, was tested. Um, Actually, I'm going, to ask, um, I'm going to ask my colleague. Uh, he's in the very back row. Uh, ben, can you stand up? <laughs> so Ben, why don't you come on up here? <laughs> I know uh, Ben was asking for it. When he give had, give when he Ben asked, the microphone. Give Ben the microphone as he comes up. So uh, I think it's hard for me to answer a question like this. I would just say that once you start working, you want to surround yourself with people much smarter than you, okay? And Ben and I have, uh, have he helped me uh, uh, kick off the business, although he's got, he's got a lot of gray hair here. I know he's got a lot of years behind him. Uh, ben, ben actually grew up in California, uh, went to Harvard, went to uh, work on Wall Street, and then he, uh, he worked at a private equity firm with me. So he's, he's kind of lived uh, you know, outside of my environment growing up, and he's now been involved in the, in the Huntsman uh, environment now. He's gotten to know my father well and how we do business. But um, uh, he's been around a lot of people who I think of uh, the, the word integrity probably doesn't mean a whole lot. And I think we as a firm are trying to establish ourselves with that. But uh, Ben, maybe I, I, I think from an outsider's perspective, um, uh, actually would like to hear if, uh, if you have any thoughts on, on that and how real or not real you think that may be with us. There's only one answer here, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, look, I think it's a, actually a very fair question that I've thought about a lot for me personally. You know, I started my career, I did the rat race thing where I went to New York and joined a Wall Street firm, you know, joined a private equity firm which was involved with the family, then went back to New York for another private equity firm. And I think the thing that I learned from the three firms that are at, you know, I looked at my, uh, you know, my direct my bosses, my, my people around me, and I never felt like these were people that I necessarily wanted to be when I grew up or when I got older in my career. And, and a big part of that was the integrity. You know, we are in an industry, um, especially finance, especially things on Wall Street, where a lot of uh, uh, your, your integrity is tested every day, all right? And I think with, uh, how media is reporting on things today, you really don't have a lot of margin for error, which is a good thing, right? I think you see a lot of CEOs, a lot of, uh, a lot of companies coming out with a lot of bad uh, decisions that they make that ultimately, uh, you, you look at these people and you say, 
I never want to be in that position. Um, and I think that was that was the tough part for me from all my three different careers where it felt like, you know, it just everyone was walking the line. And I think the, the most lasting impression I'll have had worked with the Huntsman family uh, for now, what, now the last four years, three and a half years, is that John always tells us the integrity is, is everything in our in our business. And at the end of the day, you could you can try to squeeze out an extra dollar from folks, but is that worth, you know, jeopardizing your integrity, your reputation going forward? And I think that's really stuck with me because I certainly can't say that before coming here or even today that I'm the, of the highest integrity person. But being around someone like John and the family, it really they really drive home the, the, the fact that that's all that really matters at the end of the day. You can, you can make a lot of money, you can lose a lot of money, but your name and your reputation is the only thing you'll take, you know, day in and day out. And you just don't want to risk it. It's never worth it, so. Great. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Okay. You want to come, come get this, this mic? So while we're, while we're thinking about the next question, and please, please be ready to ask the next question. Uh, when you mention integrity, uh, your father would do deals on a handshake. There's this famous story about, was it with the Great Lakes uh, Chemical Company? Yeah. Where they did a deal on a handshake, and then between the time of the handshake and the, and the closing of the deal, the value of the business that your father had sold or had agreed to sell went up three or four times. Yes. And yet he accepted only the, the deal that was done in the handshake. And it was, the difference was like between 50 million and 200 million or 150 million, some, some number like yeah. that, order yeah. of magnitude. Yes. Yeah, I've never right. heard of that. I've never heard of that before or since anybody doing that. Yeah. So the, uh, so the chemical industry during the 80s and 90s, actually going back to the 70s as well, it was very cyclical. And my father timed a lot of his buys of businesses at the bottom of these cycles, and that's uh, how he made a lot of his money in his, in his early days. Uh, he got to a point to where he was over levered, and he needed to sell off a portion of his equity, and he sold it to one of, uh, uh, one of his um, uh, uh, partners who ran another chemical business. And uh, by the time you ag agreed to this, by the time they agreed to the price until the time that they were signing the documents, usually you can have anywhere from three to six, nine months can go by while lawyers draft up and negotiate the general terms of the agreement. Well, during that time, the, uh, the chemical industry uh, uh, turned more positive, and the value of this went up uh, uh, three or four times. I think it was in the order of magnitude of several hundred million dollars. And so uh, the, um, his partner came back and said, uh, look, John, I know that we agreed to this price, but, uh, and the value is now X. Perhaps we should look at maybe splitting the difference. And my father said, no, um, I told you the price was X, and I'm going to stick to it. Yeah. And my father ended up uh, speaking at his, he asked my father to speak at his funeral, yeah. which is uh, not a, a wonderful not, tribute to him. A very, very great tribute. Now, your father's been on the other side of a deal like that. Yes. Uh, I would argue that when you all sold the business to Apollo, that yes. was the other side of the yes. deal. Yes, yes. They did not act that way. No, they didn't. Uh, and yet, uh, when you took the company back, uh, as I looked at the stock price yesterday or the day before, I think it's at an all-time high. It is, yes. I don't, is that karma or is it just great management? What is that? <laughs> oh, look, it's, it's, it's been a long road. But, uh, but yeah, they... Uh, the, the chemical industry is very strong, the U.S. economy. Uh, Huntsman today, only about 25% of the business is here in the United States, 75% of it's overseas. Yeah. So uh, it's, there's a strong demand in the, uh, in the end markets. But, um, but yeah, um, so if any of you ever go into uh, mergers and acquisitions, there's a, uh, there's a term when you negotiate these, uh, these purchase agreements called a, what's called a MAC, which is a, uh, material adverse clause, which is if there's something material that happens from the time that you sign the contract to the time that you close, uh, the buyer can get out of the transaction. And it's been in contracts for decades and decades. And Apollo at the time, who was trying to get out of the contract, used that portion of the contract to get out. And they sued. And it went to the, uh, went to the Delaware courts, which is where all 
large business disputes go, and the Delaware courts ruled that it's almost impossible to invoke what's called a MAC or material adverse effect, MAE or MAC. And, uh, and now that's in many ways for all corporate lawyers uh, in New York that do large transactions, they refer to that as kind of the Huntsman rule, the Huntsman, rule. Huntsman Apollo rule, yeah. that uh, Macs just are ironclad and you can't use a Mac to get out of a contract, so. And yet your dad was able to solve that problem with Apollo with a one-on-one -on -one conversation with yes. Mr. Black, as I recall. Yes. And if, if I have my facts correctly, you've also done business with them since. I think you bought a business from them yes, in we the did. real estate business. Yep. Uh, uh, and uh, you found a way to work with them, even though there was this great disappointment after they had come and looked you and your brothers yes. and sisters in the eye and said, we're going to do this deal. Yes. It's a very small world out there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there, there are certain individuals that you are never wanting to go back to, but with my father, he has a way of, uh, of always mending bridges and, uh, and mending relationships. Uh, it was a very tough fight for uh, both my father and Apollo, and uh, I, I don't think they've ever seen, uh, they're one of the largest private equity firms in the world today, worth, uh, worth tens, uh, if not hundreds of billions, yeah, worth hundreds of billions of dollars, and, uh, and uh, I don't think they've ever seen a uh, relationship like that since then, or a transaction like that since then. I don't think so either. Do we have one or two more questions before we need to end? We've got several hands back up there. Who's got the mic? Please stand and tell us your name and your class. Hi, my name's Michael Bountner. I am a marketing major and I'm a junior here at Utah State. My question is for Mr. Huntsman. As the owner of the Salt Lake Tribune, is that correct? Yes. Um, in the industry today, I'm sure there can be a lot of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Some people say that newspapers are, are a thing of the past. Yep. As you go to work every day, how do you dare mighty things to keep your company alive and how can we learn from your example? Oh boy, that's a tough question. Uh, I'll, I'll just be completely honest. There is no business model today in, in the newspaper industry. Uh, quite frankly, I bought this business. I threw out all my rules that, that I typically use to buy businesses. Uh, I bought it for the betterment of the community a year and a half ago. And now that I've been in it for a year and a half, and whatever you may think of Trump or not, He's declared war on the press. And when you declare war on the press, you declare war on the First Amendment. And when you declare war on the First Amendment, you declare war on our fundamental democratic principles that we have as a country. And our First Amendment is what keeps us from becoming a banana republic. And so many times I think we take advantage and, and we don't really realize how wonderful the basic freedoms we, ha we have, speech, assembly, of worshiping uh, and, uh, and of the press. And the press is the watchdog of democracy. And um, so uh, I will say that today I'm uh, working hard to make sure that it is, is a sustained business going forward. Uh, it's tough. Uh, we, we've made a tremendous amount of changes the last year in terms of our digital product. We'll be coming out with a, uh, with a paywall in January. I'm sure that may upset a couple readers uh, here and there, but the reality is, is what is the price of democracy? Actually, I'll tell you, it's, it's going to be seven ninety nine uh, come January 2nd, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, it's, it's a, um, it's a, it's, it, it is a, uh, it, it is a, uh, a challenging and tough business, but this is more than a business proposition. This is making sure that, uh, that we, that we have a strong, and viable free press in our community to provide transparency, to provide independent reporting, and to be watchdog journalists. This last year we won a Pulitzer Prize for, uh, for um, uh, sexual assaults and how those are reported and managed at Brigham Young University. And, uh, and many, uh, there were polls that were just down there in the last few weeks that even today most of those still aren't being reported to the police. And, uh, so we're going through a huge cultural shift, not only on campuses, but as you've seen in the corporate world and in the media world and so forth, and I think with our politicians where uh, you know, certain behaviors just will not be accepted going forward. And, and uh, the media plays a big role in terms of just being able to help advance 
and help our society move forward, and most important, to be a protector and a watchdog over the First Amendment, which we can't ever jeopardize those freedoms going timely, away. Timely counsel. One final question, then we're going to have to break. OK, so my name is Morgan Pieper. Um, I'm a senior graduating in like a week. Um, my question is for um, people that are leaving college. Um, when you first get your first job, uh, what what kind of advice would you have um, for being happy with where you are, but also like looking ahead and um, reaching your full potential? So look, I, I wouldn't worry too much about your first job. Uh, I know all of you are sweating, worrying about your first job. Uh, ben talked about, you know, at Harvard, my, my son at Wharton, everyone is trying to go after the most high paying, the most high profile jobs. The reality is that the vast majority, if not all of you, will be in a different job two years after the fact. And you know, you're a very mobile generation. Uh, the times in your 20s, uh, I would look at this, even though you're going to be graduating from this wonderful institution, that is still uh, uh, your, um, your, your education is going to continue for the next two to three jobs that you have. So really spend that time to refine your skills and find out, A, what you're good at. Be what you love doing, and see who's going to, you know, who's going to pay you to do that. Because you want to be able to monetize, provide a living, for those skills that you're really good at. And you'll find that your first job that you thought was your dream job and what you wanted to do, it'll probably lead to something else that you're much better at and that you really enjoy and that you love doing. So realize that uh, it won't be till 15, 20 years that you'll really begin to hit your stride with your uh, with your occupation. It's not going to be when you're 20, 22, 23. It may be, it might not be. Uh, you, may, uh, you may hit gold here early on in life, but be patient. Don't try to, uh, don't get frustrated. Uh, you're going to go through a lot of frustrations, but with each uh, frustration that you go through, you'll learn what you don't want in life. You'll learn how not to treat people. And uh, it's, again, that'll all be part of your learning experience, going through nightmare jobs and working for people that you just don't like. Uh, but yet, sometimes you just need to stick with it, learn, learn a skill, and at the appropriate time, you can move on uh, to your next and better opportunity in life. But be patient with your first job. It's, it's, it's not going to be your only one, and I promise it won't be your last one, but it'll be a great learning opportunity. Thank you, Paul. It's been great. Can we get you to come back? Oh, sure, absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. That was true. All right, I'm going to sneak here on this mic. Um, we want to thank all the Huntsman Scholars for coming today and those other students who were able to join us. Um, we force you to le read a lot in the program, so we thought it would be great to send uh, John and Karen a little uh, package of thank you notes from all of our scholars. So if you wouldn't mind bringing this back to them and your family, that would be great. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.